Welcome to the Advanced Swimming Performance Podcast sponsored by our friends at Commit Swimming, the smartest workout log. Just type a set and Commit instantly calculates the data for you. To learn more, visit commitswimming.com. We highly recommend it. My name is Jenny Brozina. I'm representing Aqueous and I'm here with Dr. John Mullen from Swimming Science. John, how are you today? Oh, I'm doing well. Just, you know, clicking away. You know how it goes. <laughs> I do. And I have to say, I am down here in Florida working with some uh, great people over on the southwest side on the Gulf Coast. And I was so excited because I had uh, this full setup ready to go, showcasing the beautiful scenery. I figured, man, <laughs> this is like my trump card, right? I could totally trump John now with my background or something. Downpour absolute downpour uh, so now i'm inside i got a boring background and what are you gonna do <laughs> what can you do hey it's, it's hard to trump all the aesthetics of the back room of my office over in uh, at core in santa clara you know beautiful thing <laughs> i love it so we're off to a good start i've been getting a lot of great feedback from people listening to the podcast and i think uh we should just remind people this is a great podcast to include in any coaching staff meetings, any clinical staff meetings, um, and people are more than welcome to get in touch with either of us uh, for any type of questions, comments, anything like that. We are here to both educate and entertain as well as listen to listeners. So, Yeah, one thing that you know a lot of uh, medical professionals do, particularly in the PT field, they have you know a journal club, they call it, where yep. you know every so often we'll just say once a month. Um, one person is meant to either review an article, listen to something, or even everyone on staff is meant to, you know, do some sort of homework. And then they just have a kind of a roundtable discussion or someone leads the way about, you know, what they learned, what their thoughts are, if they want to take any of that information and implement it, or really what they want to do with it. And I think coaching education, um, management of younger coaches, coaching mentorship really has a long way to go. Yeah, yeah. So all of our listeners, you should be playing this at your journal club. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with the video, right? Come on, yeah. doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> all, all right, John, right. what are we talking about today? Yeah, we're going to start talking about dolphin kicks, kinematics uh -huh. of dolphin kicks, what we know about it, maybe how it's progressed or why it's you know improved uh, the sport of swimming, at least velocity-wise, so much, and, and all that fun jazz. So I think one thing uh, we can just start off with is maybe – discussing some different theories on dolphin kick biomechanics. Yeah. yeah, well, first of all, I love the fact that dolphin kicking has now kind of been coined the fifth stroke. I, I know it's not a mainstream thing yet. I have been hearing it more and more, but I dig it. I like it. I like where everyone's going to be paying it that much attention. Um, from the very early stages of, of coaching, I think we hear a lot, the biggest cue, kick from your hips, not your knees, mm -hmm. right? And I think um, that's very confusing to very young kids. They don't necessarily know how to isolate um, their hips or how do you initiate a movement from their hip, but that cue is put out so often that I think across the house we know um, that we get more power, obviously, from our trunk and our core and our hips rather than our knees. Um, but I think with any philosophy we go with, we can do a little bit better job cueing uh, and educating what that cue really means. Um, because I think every single one of us has seen a six-year-old being told, you know, kick from your hips, and before you know it, they're really kicking from their shoulder and they're just jolting their entire body. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? No, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I didn't think how confusing that type of cueing could be, but I certainly agree that, geez, you work with a youth athlete, maybe even an adult athlete, you know, the hip, pelvis, hip, pelvis, low back complex is, is very confusing to people. I mean, we'll in our clinic have people hip hinge to learn how to restore hip yeah. motion without bending their spine. And it's, it's a challenge. Uh, so if you imagine throwing someone in the pool and requesting a similar thing, Certainly, they're going to be, you know, gaining motion from every body part, you know, here, there, and around the globe. So it's trying to figure out, really, I think, what um, the best strategy is, what the fastest strategy is, and then, like you said, you know, what's the cueing that can be done. When I think about the different, you know, dolphin kicking, you know, styles or, or suggestions from coaches, there's the Bob Gillette uh, mindset, who's worked with Misty Hyman, who does a lot of the fish kicking, who wants, you know, <laughs> The whole body yeah. kicking, moving, yeah. all that fun stuff. And then we have a different debate where we have people that are thinking of, all right, let's get that kick tempo going. Let's have more of that knee-based 
um, tempo driven kicking style. Um, you know, obviously I think there is some individualization based off of which one of these is going to work for each athlete based off of their particular skill set. But I want to get your thoughts on if you think one is preferred over the other or your thoughts in general. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, I think both depending on the athlete can, can work. And again, going back to that individual, individualization. Um, I think if we are actually taking a look at the hydrodynamics in a real physics-based perspective, we could find strengths and weaknesses to both claims. Um, but I think in terms of the actual movement of the athlete and being able to control the water, I work with so many athletes that have no idea what it feels like to activate their anterior chain and their posterior chain and what that feels like against the water. Mm -hmm. And my theory is if you don't know how to control each one of those chains and, and for more of our coaching staff, you know, the activating the musculature on the front of the body versus the back of the body. That means that your kick is not being as beneficial as possible. So if you are doing a much more exaggerated fish, fishing, I believe you said, um, where you, you know, fish you're getting a, a huge arc, if you're going much faster and less of an arc, if you're not getting your muscles to do anything, you're just wasting energy. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always where I start is can they actually feel activation on the anterior chain and the posterior chain first and foremost. And then I want to see where their energy is being wasted. So can they actively control their core and do an anterior and posterior tilt during their uh, dolphin kick? If so, then are they utilizing energy well? Are they wasting energy inefficiently within their streamline? So I pretty much take a look core first, um, core, trunk, hip complex first, and then after that, where is energy being wasted? That's typically the approach that I take. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think, yeah, being able to do those, you know, things is, is obviously quintessential. And I think that's where part of the debate comes up is, you know, yeah, one way may be faster for some, but there still can be energy leaks and figuring out which one is the best for each person really is key. I mean, most of the research I read on it really does suggest that more of a knee-based, higher tempo-based kicking is faster than mm -hmm. the larger undulation. But mm -hmm. then you start watching some of the, you know, great swimmers and, you know, you'll see some of big undulations. You know, Caleb Dressel, for example, uh, not a butterflyer, but uh, a very fast sprinter, really has a large undulation underneath the water. So I think you have to figure out what works for you, what is going to be most efficient if you can activate, you know, anterior and posterior core and also be able to maintain that body moving forward. Some people will just use energy and waste movement just for the sake of movement. And right. it's something that's really inefficient and detrimental to velocity. Right. I want to talk more about that in one second. But first, a nice message from our friends over at Commit. If you need a better way to log your swim workouts, you should absolutely check out Commit Swimming. It tracks your workout history, analyzes trends in your training, and most importantly, it's extremely easy to use. All you have to do is type your workout like you would a Word document, and everything else is automatically taken care of. If you head on over to commitswimming.com, you can get a free trial right now. Um, I think that when we are looking at dolphin kicking, we do have to go into the world of traje trajectory as well. Gosh, I can mm. never say that. Um, <laughs> because I think if, if you have more of a large undulation, right, I think it's very easy to see that your hand placement is almost initiating a movement. Mm -hmm. It's initiating where your direction is going. And from the research that I read and the clinical practices that I'm involved with, a lot of times we see that negatively impact the rest of the, the muscular skeletal chain. If your hands are actually doing the direction as opposed to your core, trunk, hip being in charge of it, then we oftentimes will see some type of a negative performance impact. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you see the same? No, I definitely, definitely. And like we said, efficiency of trajectory and all the types of movement really are key. You know, every wasted motion, another meter swum in a 50 meter event is, is huge and will add, you know, a very great amount of, or a significant amount of time during that race that will, you know, really make a change in performance. So being able to figure out what is the best trajectory for this person 
how can they control their trajectory? If it's a huge undulation, they'll probably have a harder time controlling that motion. So it might be something that, you know, you're, you're working small, smaller kicks with some athletes to try and get their tempo up when they're younger. And then you're trying to get them to, you know, get more muscular musculature involvement as they learn how to one, move their body to generate power and then get them to understand how important that trajectory is. And they'll have a better feel for where they are in the water and better sense, but trying to maybe teach a huge undulation with a younger swimmer um, really might be tough because they may not have any core control or strength to be able to do so. Right. Or even awareness. I mean, I've mm -hmm. seen so many coaches that are saying, okay, kick from your hips, kick from your hips, keep kick from your core. And the, you know, the younger kids are like, where are my hips? <laughs> you know, so we really have to take it back to the very, very beginning with our youngsters. Um, from a clinical perspective, let's kind of get more anatomically based. If we have a swimmer coming in and they are more of the elite high school or elite age group uh, demographic and mm -hmm. they are starting to experience low back pain. Low back pain is one of the top five injuries for swimmers across the house and oftentimes we do see it mostly occurring in either butterfly breaststroke or the dolphin kicking. What yeah. are some of the the big things that you look for when you have an athlete coming in and they're starting to experience that low back pain during those times in their swimming? Yeah. First, like you said, trying to figure out what is causing their pain, what movement patterns are they having pain in? Is it when they're flexing forward, suggesting maybe it's a type of disc issue or some sort of sciatic issue or nerve mobility issues they're having pain down the back of the leg? Is it when they're extending back up when they're coming up for maybe the breath or on their dolphin kick there? So really figuring out what is the cause, what is the movement pattern causing that pain? And then, you know, first it's trying to resolve that pain with either manual skills. And then after that, we talk about maybe what, what can we change with your stroke that is involving that movement pattern? Maybe it's a faulty breath on your fly where you're coming up too high or yeah, maybe you that's are over undulating during your dolphin kicks. And maybe we, if we tighten it up, you won't really lose any velocity, but you will have no pain. And that, then that sounds that's, better. Yeah, so that's a good one. To, you know, figure out what's the painful movement. If we modify it, what will that do to performance? And then obviously doing the things outside the pool to, you know, have it recover, which is typically some form of manual therapy and some form of strength, stability, proprioceptive work as well. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I typically, um, the, the biggest things that I see is, again, that hyperextension during mm -hmm. a breath. That's normally number one culprit. And I, I think we underestimate just how much room we actually need just to get that breath in. Um, you don't need that much. <laughs> uh, no, and um, I, I know it's one of the most challenging things to actually uh, train in the water, but you should be able to get a posterior pelvic tilt during dolphin kicking. And you should be able to come up and get that breath at that same time. Um, and making sure that when you are extending through the back and getting that breath in, you're still moving forward as opposed to moving upward. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll see, you know, are the legs dropping down really low? That's obviously a very, very easy one. Are you having a huge splash, particularly with butterfly, when you're re-entering into the water? That's another great cue. Um, typically, if we can fix that first and foremost, the second thing that we see Uh-oh, looks like we're having some technical difficulties. Uh, Jenny seems to have frozen up there. So I think what she was really getting at, you know, like she said, the, the hyperundulation when they're arching their back too much, that's going to be causing some extra tightness in their low back and likely some discomfort. So when an athlete is breathing forward in butterfly, really encourage them to be low on the water, especially if they're moving quickly, they'll actually create a little tunnel for their head to move through, like you'll see in a lot of great Michael Phelps pictures and clips. Um, outside of that, you know, we'll see things in hyper extension on a breaststroke breath, once again, causing that low back discomfort. Um, some other common areas for low back pain with dolphin kicking are rounding too much during that down kick. So make sure that the spine is still staying relatively erect. So once again, overall, when we are working with our athletes and trying to help them out with their dolphin kicks, I'm in the mindset based off of the research to have them realize that forward is the number one goal always moving forward is key. And then after that, realize that going through huge range of motions really can be challenging for athletes when they don't have the strength, they don't have the motor control. So starting them maybe with a faster tempo kick from their knees, and then after that, progressively 
adding in more range of motion, initiation from the hips and core once they know what those structures are. And then you can figure out if they need to be doing more of a fish-like larger undulation, if that's a successful movement for them once they have that strength, movement skill, and control. So once again, that's what we see from the research and clinically makes sense where you can just start changing things little by little and saying, how does that change performance? And that's really a great aspect that coaches can do where you're adding up one thing in or slowly changing it and seeing what's happening with performance in their little test tube of your swimmers that you get to experiment with on a daily basis here. Okay, so that's once again, once what we have with their detailed dolphin kick debate. We'll always see variations based off individualization and swimmers being able to maximize what best fits their specific needs. But having a plan, approach, and a reasoning behind it really is key. So thanks again for joining with us here, and we'll see you next time.